Freedom of expression. It's one of our most cherished rights. One of the things that makes America, America. The right to say whatever you want to whoever you want. Of course, you can't say it just anything you want to, right? There are rules about these things. But this isn't just any old area of the law. This involves the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So what are the rules? What can you and can't you say? When is the government allowed to interfere with your right to free speech? Let's spend a little time talking about some of the basic law here. First, the amendment itself is pretty clear and short. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So there you have it. Everything you need to know, so I can just, oh that's odd, it only says Congress. So the states are free to do whatever, right? Not quite. Through the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War, most of the rights in the Bill of Rights have been extended to cover actions by state governments as well as the federal one. Even so, what counts as abridging the right? Uh, no. Better. You should know that banning or restricting speech counts, but so does taxing it. Also, it doesn't matter if you actually talk at all. Protected expression includes any actions designed to convey a specific message where there's a good chance that the message will be understood by the audience. There are two general ways a law can restrict speech. Either a law can restrict speech based on what is being said, which is called content-based restriction, or a law can restrict speech based on something else, like where the speech is happening or how the speech is being made. Rules about what you can say are really hard to get past. Rules about how you can say it are usually easier to make. There are some categories of content in speech that are easy to regulate. These are categories like obscenity, meaning anything X-rated, fraudulent misrepresentation, meaning lying to people to get their money, defaming someone, meaning lying to harm their reputation, advocacy of lawbreaking, and so on. You can sort of imagine why those kinds of speech might not be as well protected as others. To be considered advocating breaking the law, you need to say something that is designed to get people to commit an illegal act in the immediate future and that is actually likely to cause such a thing to happen. It's not enough to just talk about illegal things. Then there's fighting words. That's when someone says something designed to inflict injury or cause a breach of the peace. This is kind of a vague definition, so the fighting words also have to do more than just make someone angry. They need to contain some specific words or deeds calling for violence. It's also not enough that the police just have a general concern about violence happening. Sometimes the government has tried to restrict speech as fighting words on the grounds that it would be found offensive, but those rules are usually struck down. Some rules about hate speech directed towards minorities have been left standing, but they have to be pretty narrow. And then there's obscenity. Obscenity has been really hard for the courts to figure out, and it varies a lot from case to case. The modern definition is that it has to be about sex, that it needs to be something that would offend the average person in that community, and that it needs to be lacking in redeeming social value. So you can get out of obscenity by saying you're being artistic. But this only applies to obscenity in public. The government can't regulate private possession of obscene material. And there you have it. Now that we have a working definition of freedom of speech, let's look at the recent decision of Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, and touted to be one of the richest men in the world. Let's look at his decision to purchase the social media platform, Twitter. The decision to purchase Twitter was not an inexpensive one. In fact, it was a $46.5 billion deal. Billion with a big B. And Mr. Musk, used 21 billion of his own money, $12.5 billion from a loan taken against Tesla's stock and 13 billion from investment bank, Morgan Stanley. There had initially been some controversy surrounding the sale, but on October 28th of this year, the deal was closed. There were skeptics who wondered why Musk purchased Twitter. Well, Elon Musk wrote a letter that was posted on Twitter explaining why he purchased the social media giant. In essence, Mr. Musk wrote, The reason I acquired Twitter is because it is important to the future of civilization to have a common digital town square where a wide range of beliefs can be debated in a healthy manner without resorting to violence. There is currently great danger that social media will splinter into far right-wing and far left-wing echo chambers that generate more hate and divide our society. 
There were immediately skeptics who felt that Elon Musk would make changes to the platform by allowing all types of speech, including hate speech. It was noted that almost immediately after sale, there was a spike in hate speech from groups asserting what they believed to be hate speech or possibly thinking that Musk with this purchase would be more liberal in his approach to censorship on the platform. Concerned that people's perception that Twitter would become the cesspool for every negative thought in someone's head, Musk came out swinging, saying that no major content decisions or account reinstatements would occur until after his moderation council convenes. Of note were some pretty high profile people on the Twitter site who immediately said they were done. One such person included Shonda Rhimes. There were also interesting tweets wondering when Musk would reinstate the account of former President Donald Trump. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Such an honor and a pleasure to be part of this terrific panel. We certainly can and should have discussions what our ideal is in terms of free speech on campus and to balance that against other values. But the reality is what the campus can do is constrained by the First Amendment. Because this is a public university, the First Amendment applies. Above all, the First Amendment means that all ideas and views can be expressed on a college campus. The government, including a public university administration, can never prevent or punish speech because of the viewpoint expressed. Now, that doesn't mean that free speech is absolute. Long ago, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, there's no right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. But the Supreme Court has said that the categories of unprotected speech are limited and they have to be narrowly defined. Let me mention them to you because again, it very much can influence the discussion we're having this afternoon. The Supreme Court, for instance, though it's not relevant to our discussion, he said that child pornography is speech not protected by the First Amendment. False and deceptive advertising is speech not protected by the First Amendment. That speech the government can punish. For our purposes, though, there are some categories that might arise on college campuses where speech can be prevented or punished. Incitement of illegal activity is speech that's not protected by the First Amendment. But the Supreme Court has defined incitement in a very circumscribed way. The court has said in order to be incitement, there has to be a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity, and the speech has to be directed at causing imminent illegal activity. The court has said that true threats are speech not protected by the First Amendment. A true threat is speech that reasonably causes a person to imminently fear for his or her physical safety. So if a person was surrounded by an angry mob and the mob was shouting at the individual, so the person feared for his or her physical safety, that wouldn't be speech protected by the First Amendment. Harassment is speech that's not protected by the First Amendment. There's no right for an employer to say to an employee, sleep with me or you'll be fired, even though it's just words. But in the context of employment, or in the context of education, usually to be harassment it has to be speech that's directed at a person. It has to be pervasive. It has to interfere with the person's educational opportunities based on criteria like race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. Now you'll notice as I go through these categories of unprotected speech, what I haven't listed. And that's hateful speech, offensive speech. In fact, the Supreme Court has made it clear that speech cannot be punished cannot be prevented just because it's hateful or offensive, even if it's very deeply offensive. In the early 1990s, over 300 college universities across the country adopted so-called hate speech codes. Without exception, every one of them to come to court was declared unconstitutional. Why? We all know that hate speech can cause real harms. We protect speech because it has effects. If speech was meaningless, we wouldn't regard it as a fundamental right. The effects can be positive. Speech 
can be ennobling, uplifting, but it can also be hurtful and cause great pain. Hate speech does that. And yet what the courts all said is it seems impossible to define what's hate speech. Usually the hate speech code said will prohibit speech that stigmatizes or demeans. But what does that mean? Also, we've learned that laws that prohibit hate speech, whether in countries or on campuses here, are much more often used against those that we're trying to protect than any other group. When the University of Michigan adopted a hate speech code, literally every prosecution under it was brought against minority students. Perhaps most of all, the Supreme Court has said that hate speech is protected because it expresses an idea. And remember what I said to start, all ideas and views can be expressed on campus, no matter how offensive. One other thing that should inform our discussion and your thoughts about this issue, campuses can have time, place, and manner restrictions with regard to speech. Even though free speech is protected on a public university campus, it doesn't mean there's a right to speak literally at any time, at any place, or in any manner. The campus can restrict speech so as to preserve the educational opportunities on campus and also to protect public safety. You have a right to speak, but you don't have a right to come in my classroom when I'm teaching and disrupt what I'm doing through your speech activities. No one has a First Amendment right to come in this auditorium now and yell in a way such the panel can't go on. That's what time, place, and manner restrictions means. And so the campus can limit where and when and how speech goes on to make sure that it doesn't disrupt campus activities and also to protect public safety. The issue of public safety has been much in the news and certainly very relevant on this campus. And the Supreme Court and the lower courts have been clear that the campus has the obligation to protect speakers of all views. Even if it's expensive, the campus has the obligation to do so. But if the campus, through every possible effort, cannot find any other way to protect public safety, then it can cancel a speaker. That should be a last resort. It should be only if there's no other way to do so. And it can never be based on the viewpoint of the speaker. But the campus does also have an obligation to protect the safety of its students, its staff, and its faculty. So I've covered for you in a little less than five minutes what I usually spend a semester going over <laughs> in my <laughs> law students and undergraduates. But maybe the most important thing I can say to frame this discussion is something that, again, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said. He pointed out, we don't need freedom of speech to safeguard the speech we like. We'd naturally let that happen. He said what we really need free speech for is the speech we hate. And he said that the best response to the speech we don't like is more speech. Now that we have a scholarly and practical definitions of free speech, let's look at a modern day consequence of free speech. Do we all remember when Kanye West said, when you hear about slavery for 400 years? For 400 years, that sounds like a choice. Or perhaps when he appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with a crown of thorns saying, God chose me, he made a path for me, I'm God's vessel. Didn't stop there, folks. Or when he showed up at Paris Fashion Week with a White Lives Matter shirt on. I think Kanye failed to understand that Black Lives Matter too is what Black Lives Matter means. Then there was the interview where he speculated about the cause of death for George Floyd, saying it was due to fentanyl, and everyone knew that was not true. And now he's facing a $250 million lawsuit for those comments. Or imagine the audacity of a black male suggesting that white straight males are judged more than anyone else. I think there are many people in the African-American community, particularly African-American men, who would disagree with that statement. 
And there's always that thing that breaks the camel's back saying I'm going to go death con three on Jewish people. And so now we're seeing the fallout. His Twitter account was locked on October the 9th. Balenciaga ended their relationship. Then the documentary about his life was put on hold. Adidas, Gap, and Foot Locker kicked him to the curb. And he has to transfer all of his assets out of his bank. And the list continues. A couple of things by way of background. So uh, I was at the ACLU, the legal director of the ACLU for a number of years. I think that's where Erwin and I first met. Uh, so I care deeply about these issues, but I've also written about these issues and think about them a lot. Um, and um, I want to pick up on some of the threads that people have talked about. And uh, first of all, I think the country's in a very incredible place. And I think um, in some ways, I really applaud this effort to have this conversation over the year, but I don't think this is a defining issue in the country. I think the defining issue in the country is the question of white supremacy. Uh, and it gets, it gets swept under the rug. Uh, if you, there's a, a new article out in the Atlantic about Trump being the first white president. Um, and this is important. The country has not been this divided since the Civil War. We are fighting the Civil War, and I would say the South is winning. These are huge issues. And, and I agree with a lot of stuff that a lot of the panelists said. So Stephen talked about the country pulling itself apart. But I would say the country is pulling itself apart because it refused to embrace the Gettysburg Address. When Lincoln talked about a new birth of freedom, when Stephen talked about where all the people who have been excluded could become part of the political community, that is what Trump and the right wing is fighting against. It is basically the critical question for this country is can we have an inclusive we? We the people. Uh, and there's some people in power in the White House who says no. It's not simply the people who disagree with me. People are saying, like they did in Dred Scott, you are not human. You don't belong. So. Uh, many people who talk about the First Amendment, and I think uh, Dean uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who's been a friend for many years, his recitation of the Supreme Court, I would agree with, except I think the Supreme Court is wrong. And it's not the first time they've been wrong. Uh, they've been wrong many times. They supported the fugitive slave law. They supported segregation. They supported keeping women out of the workplace. They supported, and so it's not enough to say, this is what nine, usually guys, and now we have some women, uh, uh, this is what they think. Uh, I'm old enough, and Erwin's old enough, to know, what, know that the whole meaning of the First Amendment has been radically shifted since the 1970s. You could not have had Citizens United in the 1970s. Uh, so what is speech? Is money speech? Is corporate money speech? Supreme Court for 100 years said no. This Supreme Court said yes. So it's not enough to say, well, they said it. We are moral beings. Uh, and we have to sort of think about things in a much deeper way than just what the court said. Uh, now, Chancellor Chris, as others, go back to John Stuart Mills. Um, and in a piece I wrote, which i give you the name of, it's called Worlds Apart, I talk about John Stuart Mills. John Stuart Mills was brilliant. And he sort of laid the foundation for both the concept of liberty and the concept of free speech. And so it's not surprising that people cite John Stuart Mills. But this is the point that I want to make. He was wrong. And part of the reason he was wrong is because he didn't have the benefit of what we've learned in the last 100 years. So Mills' concept of speech is quite simple. He's a complicated man, but it's quite simple. He said, my liberty stops at the tip of your nose. What he meant by that, and he had a concept for it, he called other regarding acts and self-regarding acts. So a self-regarding act was something I did that didn't really physically or uh, impact others. Those are self-regarding acts. And he said those are natural liberties, and speech is one of them. And we should not, the state should not regulate natural liberties. But he said 
liberties that actually harm someone else, he called other regarding acts. Liberties that harm someone else are other regarding acts, and the individual does not have a right to other regarding liberties. Those are social liberties. Society decide how to deal with that. And I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but the point that, that Mills was making is that some things injure other people. And both the concept of liberty and equality does not allow us to injure other people with impunity. Now, most of the debate around free speech and hate speech or uh, uh, discrimination is really predicated on no the notion that speech really doesn't hurt, or if it does, and maybe a little bit. So we talk about offensive speech, we talk about hate speech, and when speech actually, when we acknowledge that it hurts, we talk about speech acts. And we talk about, so for example, libel. Why do we allow that to be regulated? Because we say it hurts. So when Mills wrote, the idea is that something short of a physical injury was not a real injury. Now that same rationale was used to support another case in the United States called Plessy versus Ferguson. And when blacks complained of being segregated on rail cars, the Supreme Court responded and they said, this is a stigma that injures us. And the Supreme Court's response was, if there's an injury, it's just in your mind. It's not real. And 60 years later, when the, another Supreme Court overturned Plessy, it said, the stigmatic harm of segregation is indeed a constitutional injury. So part of the question is, does speech harm? And, and the question is obviously yes. Some of you may have been here a couple of years ago when Claude Steele spoke and talked about stereotype threat. We talk about trauma. We talk about all the things, all the ways we know that speech can harm. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful about speech. It doesn't mean we should ban speech. But it means the rationale, the underlying jurisprudence for speech is radically incoherent. And we avoid that incoherence by denying the fact that speech can in fact injure. And I would go so far as to say a lot of the people, and I don't mean they should be banned, but a lot of people we're talking about are engaging in harmful acts. That's their intent. They don't want a dialogue. Now, Emerson, another free speech scholar, talked about four different reasons for free speech. He talked about self-autonomy, participation, truth, and stability. So almost everyone who talks about free speech in a serious way say that speech is a multiple set of values. What happens when those values conflict? What do we do then? So in that sense, I would say it's very hard in a deep sense to be an absolutist because you're talking about a complex set of values. And one reason we actually don't like regulating speech is that it violates the principle of both autonomy and equality. Um, so, in the little time I have left, I just want to just throw out two, a couple of the concepts. I want to invite you to do um, what was just suggested, to think deeply. Uh, one of my buddies is, is uh, head of the Enterprise Institute and, and a very conservative, so I don't think people should just talk to people who agree with them. But there's a way in which we can talk. There's a way in which we can exchange. Um, I was at the ACLU. And I brought to the ACLU the question of racial harassment in the workplace. The initial response from the ACLU was, that's just speech. And I said, so why is sexual harassment in the workplace not just speech? Now think about this. In the 1970s, women go into the workplace and they see nude pictures hung up around the wall. What's the response? The response is not the old adage, you correct bad speech with more speech. And some people literally said, if they don't like the pictures the men are hanging up, they can hang up their own pictures. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So again, Oliver Wendell Holmes, talk about the marketplace of ideas. Most of us have learned that markets are radically incoherent. There are many different markets. And we don't trust markets to totally create the kind of society we want. Do we trust government? No. But it means we have to think of something in a much more sophisticated way. Uh, so let me just end by saying this. One of the points is that if we try to regulate speech, which apparently we do with child pornography, apparently we do with libel, apparently we do if you split up with your girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever and you post a picture that's reg of nude, whatever, that's regulated. So, and why? Because it's a harm. 
Should we trust government? I don't know. What do we mean by government? Do we mean the police? The same people who are saying, you know, and I would venture to say the people in Louisiana, others, when they, there's blood coming out of demonstrators at Berkeley. What about the blood coming out of Michael Brown? Oh, yeah. You know? oh, yeah. There's an article I mentioned. The defining issue in the country today is who belongs. Can the other belong? And that's the question. So you have right-wing nationalist ethnic groups popping up all around the country as the country, as countries become more diverse. That is what's challenging democracy. And, and going back again to Lincoln's thing, can we think of a new birth of freedom where all are included? Uh, and again, I actually believe strongly in equality, strongly in the First Amendment, strongly in free speech. What happens when they conflict? I think the animating principle is that belonging, participating, is what holds both equality and free speech. That's what we should be leaning to. And Canada, when they refuse to allow sexist speech, they argue that the Canadian Supreme Court, they were not allowing it because it violated the principle of belonging. Now, by some accounts, Canada has more speech than we do. Canada has more demonstration than we do. Um, they're probably not perfect, um, but I believe we can do better. And I think we do better by engaging these questions in a deep way, not in a sloganistic way, uh, not in a simple way. Uh, yes, we're in a hard place. Um, and so uh, I'm not saying we have the answers, but I think we could do better at posing the question. Thank you. Your words have the power to hurt, to heal, open minds, open hearts, and change the world. Never forget the responsibility you have over the words you speak. Stephen Hatchison.